Hello, and welcome to Health and Fitness Redefined. I'm your host, Anthony Amen. Join me today as we take a dive into the world of health and fitness, where we learn to overcome adversity, to pick back first fiction, and see health and fitness in a whole new light. Today, guys, we have a very exciting episode for all of you. So I need you to strap yourselves to the chair, because without further ado, let me welcome to the show, Norm Robillard. Norm, welcome to the show. Thank you, Anthony. Nice to be here. I am super excited to ask you all of these questions I've had in my head for so many years and finally get answers. So I'm going to use you as my guinea pig, and thank you for agreeing to do this. <laughs> Much pressure. No pressure whatsoever. <laughs> I didn't do really an intro of who you are, where you're from. I kind of wanted to leave it to you because you know you better than anyone else. So tell us, how did you get into the world of digestive health? Because that's an interesting topic. Yeah, it, it is. <laughs> um, well, my background is microbiology. And I actually used to work on some gut microbes when I was in grad school and so forth. Um, but I never really thought much about uh, my own gut health or diet. Um, you know, I just finished my education, went into, uh, you know, pharmaceutical and biotech companies. And I thought really drugs were the whole miracle and the diet really didn't matter much. I never really thought much about it. Ate whatever I wanted. Uh, but in my 30s, I started to suffer with some acid reflux and it became quite challenging. And uh, the drugs and the things my own industry had to offer really weren't the solution. I was getting some nighttime reflux and some aspiration in my lungs at night. I really felt, you know, miserable. And I still didn't know what to do about it, didn't know what caused it. But I just happened to, so an exercise story for you here. I, I happened to uh, try a low-carb diet with my son who convinced me I needed to buy a treadmill and lose a few pounds. And when I started to uh, started this low carb diet, my digestive symptoms improved dramatically, and I was just stunned by that because again I had really not thought much about diet. I was on an eat anything diet, and uh, but I thought I started thinking about what is it about low carb and 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 acid reflux, and could somehow these carbs be causing the reflux? Because that didn't seem to be the prevailing theory, which had a lot to do with these muscles at the top of your stomach, lower esophageal sphincter muscles that are relaxing or weakened. The carbs didn't fit into the picture. So I started doing some research on how the three food groups were digested, fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. And I thought, maybe I can figure this out. And within one day, I already had a working theory. I, I thought, I know what's going on. I'm consuming more carbohydrates then my 35 or 38 year old body is capable of effectively digesting and absorbing into my bloodstream. So too many of these carbs are flooding my intestines. It's filled with these hundred trillion bacteria of a thousand different species that do all these amazing things, but that I was probably overfeeding them with their preferred fuel source, which is carbohydrates. Some of these bacteria can ferment some amino acids from proteins. There are certain strains that can get a little bit of energy from fat but they get most of their energy from carbs. And I thought I'm overfeeding these, I'm getting blooms of bacterial growth. And I knew from my own studies that, that bacteria, most of these strains produce a lot of gas, hydrogen, the archaea produce methane, some of these bacteria produce hydrogen sulfide. And I just thought it might be that simple. I'm, I'm getting a lot of gas pressure from eating and malabsorbing too many carbs and it's pushing into my stomach. And that intragastric pressure in my stomach is push against the lower esophageal sphincter and it's driving reflux. So it was a new theory and a new way of looking at it. So um, long story short, I wrote a couple of books on it and I, I think I'm right. And we're, we're in a second clinical study. So, uh, you know, we'll see in the end. What are you doing this clinical uh, study? Uh, Northwestern University in Chicago. It's a, a collaborative study and there's three different diets in it. One is the fast track diet and that's my most recent you know, diet approach that I that I wrote the fast track digestion books and the fast track diet app is is based on that diet. So that will be part of the study, kind of a behavioral approach. Um, and then there's a control diet, just you know, typical things to avoid when you have reflux. So there's people that are that are con that are right now taking PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, and they have to get off to be in the study. Interesting. So, yeah. So, so we're we'll talking say. a lot about. Uh, 
acid reflux and how things are kind of working that way. And I'm just thinking of my own digestive issues and how we can really help that. So you talked a lot about carbs and how they get broken down. What's the difference between carbs, proteins, and fats? You're talking about the bacteria, but is there... Uh, I'm trying to figure out the scrubs. Is there a way like they react differently in our GI tracts, or is it just all the same how they break down? I'm sorry, what was that last part? Are they all the same? Are all macronutrients oh, the yeah. same when yeah. they break down, or yeah. is it different parts of the GI yeah. tract that break yeah. down, or are they broken down differently? Yeah. Let me talk about that. Well, for humans, right, for our own physiology, right, when we break down proteins or carbs, they are different fuel sources, but they have about the same number of calories per gram whereas fats have about twice as many. So fats have more energy for us. But in the gut, and you can imagine you know, your intestines, you've got these 100 trillion bacteria there, not very many in the small intestine, the bulk of them are in the large bowel. And so when we consume foods that have proteins, fats, and carbs, um, some of those nutrients are malabsorbed, right? Some of the, about 18, 15 to 18% of the proteins we don't digest, they'll enter the intestines. Some of the fat, we won't digest all of it, will enter the intestines. And some of the carbohydrates will enter the intestines. So these microbes, they have these three food groups available to them. Most of the carbs are complex carbs, fibers, resistant starch, things we just don't digest. But some of us are lactose intolerant, so we won't digest the lactose, so the microbes will get that. Uh, many of us are fructose intolerant, so they'll get that. And sugar alcohols in our diet, we don't digest them well. So the microbes are going to see all those nutrients. So what do they do with those nutrients? Well, you have to remember a couple of things. The gut is mostly anaerobic. So there's very little oxygen there. So a lot of what goes on in our body is oxidative metabolism. You know, the mitochondria, we're breaking down these foods in these oxidative pathways that yield a whole bunch of ATP. So it's good we're able to do that. And microbes ATP is in the gut, energy. Not, a lot of energy, ATP, right? 36 per mole of, of carbohydrate. So um, in the gut, they don't have ac uh, access to much oxygen, so they use mostly fermentative pathways. So they have to break down these nutrients and, and the electrons eventually get passed to something other than oxygen, another type of electron acceptor. So it's it's a low energy deal, but it's it's good enough for them to eke out a living they prefer, most of these microbes prefer um, carbs. Um, we can talk if we have time at the end about this Villanella atypica, which is perhaps will be the first um, athletic probiotic to improve um, performance. But anyway, most of them uh, like the carbs for energy and they produce these short chain fatty acids, butyrate, lactate, acetate, and those are fats that serve is that we can burn for energy. So the bacteria are, they're living on these carbs, they're producing these fats. We can use those fats, propionate we can use in our muscles, butyrate, our colonocytes that line our gut can use those for energy. So we're getting about half of the calories back from foods that we can't even digest, but the microbes are processing. So that's how it works. So these microbes are doing that, right? There's a survival advantage there. If we imagine in Paleolithic times, you, you, you don't have an animal kill and you start, you know, going around on your hands and knees and eating roots and things like that, that you'll have a lot of fibrous stuff that you can't process, but the microbes can't. So that fats they make is the difference between starving and not starving. That's why we've evolved with these microbes in our gut, like all other animals. So that's the good thing. They also um, regulate bio lab, uh, levels, bile acid levels. Uh, fat storage, appetite, they even uh, help control motility. So the microbes are doing all of these amazing things. Problem is when they get out of balance. I don't know, did I answer the question somewhere in there? Uh, you um, went way into detail on way that. Too so much, <laughs> but it's all good. More information is better. Uh, I know Give me you the book. It's all right. I know you mentioned lactose. And I know a lot of people are mm -hmm. lactose intolerant and can't digest any milk-based products. And I'm one of them. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So why is that the case? Do we have any research showing why a lot of us are lactose intolerant or why even so few of us aren't? And is there any issues mm -hmm. 
digesting lactose besides the constant GI distress that could cause from having too much over time? Yeah, you ask great questions. Unfortunately, every question you ask, we could spend the whole 30 minutes on, but um, there is a lot of research on that. In fact, I, when I was a postdoc at Tufts, Tufts uh, in Boston, my professor, Mike Malamy, worked on the original lactose operon at the Pasteur Institute. So I don't know if it says how old I am or how old he is, but that he, his history goes back to working on the original you know, lactose gene in E. coli. But there's been a lot of work done um, in human lactase, right? That's since lactose is the main carbon source for us in milk, human mother's milk, babies need to be able to break it down, right? And so typically we have lactase as infants. And then once we're weaned, we start having less of producing less of this enzyme. But people in certain parts of the world, like Northern European uh, countries, for instance, they had a mutation thousands of years ago and their lactase gene got stuck in the on position. So they are not lactose intolerant at all. Whereas uh, you, if you go to Greece or other parts or some Asian countries and so forth, uh, North American Indians, you'll find a lot of lactose intolerant, intolerance. So they don't have the, the enzyme as adults. Of course, you can have lactose-free products. You can consume fermented products where most of the lactose is gone because bacteria ferment them. Um, there's other things you can do. But to get to the other part of your question, is it just lactose? In mother's milk, there's also something called animal fiber. It's oligosaccharides that we don't digest, just like the, the fibers. They're designed to feed the infant gut microbiota, mostly bifidobacteria and lactic acid bacteria. And so that, that's their, the first crop of microbes in our gut is fed by these animal fibers or oligosaccharides in mother's milk. So kind of two sources, one that we can digest and one that we can't. Very interesting. Is there any issues having lactose over a long period of time? Eat consuming lactose when you're intolerant? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, lactose is, it's a simple two sugar molecule, right? Glucose and a galactose. And all you need to do is chop it in half and it can be fully absorbed in your bloodstream and metabolized. But if you don't have lactase, you can't chop it in half, it gets stuck in the gut. And so if you consume, like say you have a latte and you're lactose intolerant, you may have to rush home in time to try to get to the bathroom because unlike uh, some real tough, complex fibers, lactose, as I said, it's a simple molecule. As soon as it's clipped, it can be metabolized. So bacteria know that trick too. They can clip it, use it, and they produce a lot of gas and short chain fatty acids. So the same thing that's as a survival advantage for us, all this gas and too much bacterial activity, especially too early in the digestive tract, um, can provoke um, diarrhea, bloating, gas. Um, you know, in, in some instances, uh, a lot of fermentable material, uh, constipation, reflux. So that's the problem when when you consume more carbs than you can effectively digest, that you can just promote these um, aberrant overgrowths of bacteria and have all of these terrible GI symptoms. Interesting. Speaking mm -hmm. of GI symptoms, I think a big, uh, at this time, no, there's no diagnosis, so no technical diagnosis for IBS, and it's a diagnosis out of, well, it's not anything else <laughs> kind of deal. So can you yeah. talk to us a little bit about IBS, uh, different ways to eat for IBS, because I feel like a lot of people have it, just don't realize it because they stress mm -hmm. and they get that GI yeah. issues or just certain times it just triggers and it's yeah. very painful. Yeah. So, I mean, irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, um, there was a time we had no idea what it was. And, and a lot of people still feel like that, but we, we do have a much better idea about what it is. Um, and, and a good number of the people with irritable bowel syndrome actually have SIBO, which stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Just these concepts we're talking about. Too much fermentable material, you're not you're consuming more than you're digesting, and you have these overgrowths of bacteria in your small intestine, and you get all of these terrible symptoms. So we know that now. Back in 1950, there was a paper that was published that said IBS was like a mental health issue. 
And that was also back in 1949, a guy named Fraser uh, studied malabsorption. He published a paper on SIBO, described it perfectly. Bacteria mostly originated from the colon moving into the small intestine and competing with us for the nutrients. So it's interesting that within a year of each other, this guy figured out SIBO completely, but somebody else was completely misguided about IBS. But in the 90s, it all began to change. They started culturing bacteria from the small intestine and putting some names to some of these players. Um, Mark Pemintel's group out of Cedar sinai and others um, really started to link bacterial overgrowth with IBS. So it's pretty clear that IBS involves either SIBO or other forms of dysbiosis. There's SIFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth. There's IMO, which is a, was newly broken out. It's, a, it's an overgrowth of uh, intestinal methanogens. These, these organisms are not bacteria, but they take the hydrogen the bacteria make and they turn it into methane. And so a lot of people that are constipated have high levels of these organisms and high levels of methane. Um, and there's other forms of dysbiosis. So we're, we're learning more about it, but IBS, it's, it's becoming pretty clear. It's a, it's a situation with these aberrant, aberrant growth or overgrowth of these microbes. And what kind of simple, we have a little bit of echo, but it's okay. Um, okay. Maybe I can kind, change my mic. It's okay. So what kind of little health advice can you offer? Like as far as what we're eating, is this something mm -hmm. that you want to eat a low carb diet on? Is this something that you should actually stick to the FODMAP diet to kind of figure yes. out what your approach is? What's your opinion on right. that? Right. Well, the FODMAP diet is, is very well studied. Um, so I think that they have an advantage there. Um, the reason I developed the fast track diet um, differently is because, uh, well, I agree, agree that these FODMAPs, fermentable oligodye monosaccharides and polyols, sugar alcohols, are fermentable and can cause symptoms. I couldn't understand why some of the other diets didn't include resistant starch, because that's like a fiber, and, and fiber. And part of it is, you know, the, the things like fructose and lactose and sugar alcohols, most people and most doctors are like, oh, yeah, if you're getting digestive health symptoms from those foods, oh, limit them in your diet. You don't need them. They're bad. They'll give you symptoms. Limit them. But for some reason, resistant starch and fiber, and there's many types of fiber, but we know they're highly fermentable. We know they can provoke symptoms, but they, they seem to be part of a health craze that, oh, we're starving our microbes. We need more fiber. We need more resistant starch, whereas I don't believe that at all. Some of that may have come from, you know, uh, uh, years ago, they thought fiber would uh, prevent colon cancer, would feed the microbes, um, would, uh, what were some of the other ones? That, not, oh, would help constipation. None of that turned out to be true. And there's pretty good studies that have looked at large populations of people that had colon cancer, find people before they had colon cancer, fiber didn't seem to matter at all. There's a paper published in 2012, more fiber made constipation worse. So the benefits of fiber have just not panned out. And then do we need it to feed our microbiome? I say no, because there's so much fermentable material in our diet already, um, just to save some time, the average glycemic index of, of vegetables is 55. That means 45% of the carbs and vegetables are being digested more slowly than glucose. There's more fermentable material. So the microbes are fine and they can eat animal fiber and they're fine on a completely animal based, even a carnivore based diet. I want to, this is something I'm you, too stuck right don't now. need the plants for your microbes. <laughs> they're fine. There's a good paper published on the couple of papers on the microbiome of a cheetah. You know, it's, they're fine. The microbes will adapt and they're, and they're fine. But I'm sorry, your, your question was a little more practical, right? What can people eat? So for people with the IBS, GERD, you know, that's my history, um, and a whole variety of other functional GI issues, bloating, constipation, too much gas, they're all kind of related. And, and even some systemic illnesses, fibromyalgia, um, you know, uh, many others, a link to these types of overgrowth. So what can people eat? Well, if you go very low carbohydrate diet, that's that's simple and it's and it it's very effective, right? For these conditions, for people that are okay, you know, eating that way. Um, that's one solution. As long as if say like you're on keto, 
you can't start chomping on all of the Atkins bars that have too many sugar alcohols or eating too much fiber. So that's why the fast track diet targets these five carbs, lactose, fructose, resistant starch, fiber, and sugar alcohols. Those are the ones that are highlighted in the NICE guidelines, the European guidelines that look at Cochrane reviews and all that. It's highlighted in the textbook of primary and acute care medicines, that same five that I target quantitatively in, in the fast track diet. So the, the beauty of a, of a diet like the fast track diet is that you can have all the animal-based foods you want, all the fats and proteins you want, eggs, cheese, meats, seafood, fish. There's no limits on those. But when it comes to the plants, then you do have to make some decisions because some like uh, rices have a lot more resistant starch than others, like a basmati rice or an Uncle Ben's rice have a lot of resistant starch. It can give people a lot of symptoms. But a jasmine or a sushi rice has a different type of starch called amylopectin that's very easy to digest. So many people that can handle some of the rices with a lot of resistant starch can handle some of those other ones. That's where this FP value, fermentation potential, it's a calculation, comes in. It will tell you the difference between those, between a red potato and some other types of potatoes. I want to so dive on. into some more things. This is awesome. And I kind of <laughs> just want to get everything all together. But we mentioned uh, on a previous podcast, we were talking about different types of rice and beans, actually. So I'm really glad you brought that up where mm -hmm. we had someone talking about the phytic acids, which I think has a lot to do with uh, what you're talking about, the more fermentation mm -hmm. they would have. And he mentioned very similar things and gave tips and tricks to mm -hmm. how to go about uh, prepping rice the day before, sitting it mm -hmm. in water for 24 hours before you even think about cooking it mm -hmm. kind of deal. What's your opinion on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> well, so first of all, with with uh, beans, rice, other foods, right? In these plant-based foods, there, there's a book called Plant Paradox that really gets into that. Some of the anti-nutrients, some of these plant foods, uh, phytic acid, lectins is another one. And so soaking, cooking well, will will take care of most of the lectins. So that's people don't need to be as worried about that. Um, and there's also some gut bacteria that will metabolize some of these things from plants. Uh, so having some of those is helpful. Uh, but soaking beans, for instance, um, the, one of the bigger problems with beans, there are some anti-nutrients, but also there's these fibers in beans like stachios, raffinos, and verbiscos. They're hard to digest, very, very easy for bacteria to ferment. So a lot of people will get kind of lower GI gas they eat a lot of legumes, a lot of beans. Um, soaking can help. Um, you can, when you soak beans overnight, about 25% of these carbohydrates kind of leach out. So it's better, but it may not be enough for a lot of people. So limiting the serving size, <clears throat> eating, eating all plant-based foods, especially higher carb or higher fiber foods, eating really slowly and chewing really well, um, extremely helpful. And there's also a, a great supplement called um, alpha-galactosidase, alpha in other words, Beano, that can really help break down those particular three fibers I just mentioned. So a few things you can do there. Um, less Very is more, less is more when it comes to those. I wanna bring this back a little bit, something you mentioned actually like 10 minutes ago, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> You mentioned glycemic index, you mentioned fiber, and I'm going to tie those together real quick yes. and talk about our industry and then get your pit from your industry. So fiber to us is a great resource to help control insulin responses or blood sugar responses in our bodies, mm -hmm. where we won't get so much of a high sugar rush with mm -hmm. high fiber foods as we would with foods that don't have fiber in it which is why we constantly recommend high fiber diets, especially for diabetics. People mm. that need are concerned about how much sugar, we use the example uh, that if you take an orange and you juice the orange in a cup, and yep. then you had the full orange here and you drank the juice, that would cause mm. a blood sugar uprise or the orange wouldn't itself mm. because nature kind of balances fiber and sugar based upon the products. Like sugar cane is a bark. So if you actually eat the bark, there's so much fiber and sugar, mm. it's ridiculous. Mm. 
<laughs> and then glycemic index kind of ties into that where the higher the number, the more of a response it has on your blood sugar. Now what you're saying is eating low fiber diets is better for your GI tract. Mm -hmm. so how can we take these and bring them here? <laughs> yeah. So you've, yeah, you, you've, uh, you've cut to the, the key issue there, right? So, um, so if you want, if you have gut issues, right? People without gut issues, you can have your oranges, you can have your fiber. I, I won't bother you about it. Go for it, right? You don't have these GI issues. You, you might be able to eat a very high plant-based, high fiber diet and have no symptoms. And you're good to go. That's fine. People with these GI problems, like myself, um, we have to be careful. And so um, I personally, I tend to be on more of a low carb diet. It's just at my age, uh, I gain weight on high carbs. It's just a better fit for me in general. But the diet that I created is more flexible. So it, you can consume more carbs. But if you consume a lot of high carb food, right, it's safer for your gut to have higher glycemic index foods with this lower FP value. The two go like this. In fact, the FP calculations, basically a reversal of the glycemic index equation, wow. plus you have to add fiber and sugar alcohol. So I've reorganized that equation and added fiber and sugar alcohols to get this FP value, because we're interested now in not how many carbs are going into the bloodstream, although that's important to your question. We're interested in how many are staying behind feeding these blooms of symptom-causing microbes, right? So that's why I did it. But yeah, if you eat uh, three giant bowls of jasmine rice every day, you probably get, you know, diabetes. You don't want that either, right? And so what are the solutions? You, you mentioned one, okay, if I add a bunch of fiber, that might slow the how fast this sugar goes into my bloodstream. Okay, that's one strategy. Using the glycemic index, eating low GI carbs, right? That might um, blunt my, my sugar response. The thing is, not, neither of those techniques or approaches um, is the even close to the equivalent of just consuming less carbs. That's really the most powerful thing is just if you have issues with blood sugar, low carbs or very low carbs is, is the way to go. Um, you might get an advantage adding some fiber. You might get an advantage in some low GI foods, but you're going to also run that risk of GI symptoms if you're susceptible to those. So it's a question of balance and, and individuals, you know, it's different for different people. Yeah, I, I, great answer. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna ask you one last uh, question that all my people who are bodybuilders just, I know want me to ask, uh, then we'll tie it up and kind of end this out. But I, I need to know, problems with protein when it through like high protein levels for gi issues or is there any uh is there any downside or upside of having a high protein diet because i know for us people trying to really try to bulk on a lot of muscle we yeah. need higher protein yeah. amounts plus it satiates you a lot longer than mm. carbs does so mm. talk to us a little bit of high protein yeah. diets and if there any yeah. input on that yeah and 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 it's a it's an important but a challenging question um, my best answer, right, is instead of eating super high protein, of course, I, if I was in the gym every day with you, I might have a different, you know, a different take on things. But my, my, for most regular people, you, you don't, your body doesn't want that much protein, right? And so, but you can't consume a lot of carbohydrate calories, I mean, of fat calories. So like on a ketogenic diet, you're 75, 80 to 85% fat calories, right? Even though they pack twice the punch, so you don't need to have 85 you know, grams more, 85% more calories uh, of your calories there, but 5, 10% carbs and proteins in the middle, 20, 25%, right? That's the way a ketogenic diet is. It's high fat, and we know that works. But what you're saying is you have a different situation. You've got guys in the in the gym, they want to eat really high protein for guys whatever. Or girls. Guys or girls, muscle recovery, whatever, whatever the I use guys without without sex attached. Guys, okay. they're all guys. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, so you want to eat high protein. So what 
could be going on if you're eating high protein and you're having GI issues? Is, that's kind of your question, right? Or maybe uh, is there any long-term effects from it? Let's say you're not having GI issues. Let's say, is there a problem with your GI tract if you're just having 160 yeah. grams of yeah. protein a day? Yeah, yeah. Well, your body will have to um, process the nitrogen, right? Um, carbohydrates and fats don't have any nitrogen molecules in them. Proteins have nitrogen and carbohydrates and sulfur. You've got to process these molecules. And so you, you're going to get a, a lot of ammonia produced. Your body can take care of that, can detoxify, but you are, it is a load. You are going to have to do it. Um, in terms of gut health, you know, microbes also need some protein and they can ferment many of the amino acids, those 20 amino acids in, in, in protein, right? Many of those are fermentable. The bacteria can take in peptides, uh, break down proteins, take in peptides or individual amino acids, and they can ferment those and get energy. And also it meets their own nitrogen needs. So bacteria need some protein. And, but when you start blasting a lot of protein in there, um, I'm not completely sure what would happen, but I do think that, that our gut microbiome well, that microbiome means the cumulative genes of all these microbes, but the gut microbiota say, that's just the organisms themselves. You, when you change the diet, they change, they adjust and they shift based on the nutrients that are being supplied. And so if you give them a lot more protein, they are going to shift. You are going to get a community of organisms, an increased number of organisms that are actually adapted to doing well on proteins. Is that good or bad? And what's the limit? You know, I'd have to poke into that one a little bit more. To, to I think I have answer. a new research study for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just add a little to your load because something that yeah. I give a lot to, yeah. and it's a lot to your points, which I love, was I'm more of a high protein person because they always to disprove that protein hurts your livers or kidneys. That was always the point. Oh, too much protein hurts your kidneys. That was has since been disproven. Yeah. So yeah. having proteins and having them satiate you is way better of a dietary choice that I prescribe to people because then they are limiting a lot of carbs. They're staying fuller because protein keeps you fuller than carbs, still getting their fats in, but now I don't have the issue of people telling me that they're eating bacon for breakfast and just using butter to cook it. Like that's the issue I've always had with keto yeah. diet where people yeah. are like, yeah. then you have uh, cholesterol issues because they aren't yeah. able to show that fats are directly related to high cholesterol. You're saturated fats, not your unsaturated. No. Yeah, crazy. That's brand new. It's like I was blown away. They showed dietary cholesterol had no impact in your blood, so it doesn't cause an increase. Hence, why yeah, eggs well, are but healthy. The opposite. Yeah, fats and, and cholesterol. Right. Most of our cholesterol in our bloodstream and our body is produced by our own bodies. So the dietary fat and cholesterol just doesn't have a big impact. But the um, fats, the saturated fats, have shown to give an increase with cholesterol, which blew me away. Where unsaturated, high unsaturated fat diet has shown the opposite. So those suffering with high oh, cholesterol, minus yeah. um, genetically, because I mean, that's I, I, yeah. For the, for the complete answer, I I defer to like Nina Teicholz's uh, the Big Fat Surprise, a great book, but. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of challenges, first of all, of this idea that, that saturated fats are not don't belong in a healthy diet. I believe they do. I think there's a lot of evidence they do. So we can we can agree to disagree on that. Um, but the idea that they are turning into the cholesterol, first of all, um, people on uh, low carb, high fat diets, for, for the most part, their blood fats profiles are great. And then there's the other argument that says, even if your LDL cholesterol goes a little bit higher, if, if it's because you just started a diet and you're losing some weight, that your own body is releasing it. That's where that's coming from. And then LDL cholesterol, which is a calculation, not even a measurement, by the way, correlates quite poorly with cardi cardiovascular risk. But you know what will give you a lot of cholesterol and you know what will give you a, a high cardiovascular risk? is a real high carb diet for diabetes and your body takes these carbs that it doesn't use because you're sitting on your couch and it, it the glucose goes into the cells and they turn it into fat. Yeah. And so 
you know, the, these these questions and debates are much more than we have time for. But and that's not really my main focus. But I'm just that's those are the circles that I run in. So maybe we could have more discussions and kind of iron no, it up. Norm, I appreciate this so much. Like you, it's a lot of insight, and I love this because it shows how much health and fitness changes every second. I can't even say every day. Yeah, yeah. Every second, our fields are just change, change, I change, agree. change. And it gets confusing. <laughs> yeah. So I really appreciate it. But I wanted to just kind of summarize the fast track diet. I want you to dive into that a little bit, um, how you promote it, and just give us the input and details on all of that. Yeah. yeah. So, so as I mentioned, it's a quantitative um, limitation of five different types of carbohydrates in any food, right? Fructose, lactose, resistant starch, fiber, and sugar alcohols. You don't want too many of those if you got gut issues. They're, they're very fermentable. So you use the FP calculation to do that. Now, in, in the Fast Track Digestion books, there's one on IBS, there's one on heartburn, and in the Fast Track Diet mobile app, uh, most of that work gets done for you. There's tables with all these foods and what these FP values are, which are basically in grams. And so when you make your meals in the app, say you're just adding foods and you're saying, I want a cup of this and I want a tablespoon of that, it will count. It will calculate all these points. And then on a weekly or monthly basis, you can go to a different chart and just see how, how am I doing controlling my FP points? And what about my symptoms? You can plug in all your symptoms and you can see your symptoms going up and down and seeing if they're paralleling uh, the points or not. So uh, in a nutshell, that's what the books are about. And you'll see in the book and in the app, there's um, some notations that you can call the Digestive Health Institute um, and reach me and you can consult with me. And so I, I typically spend 15, 20 minutes on the phone with somebody, find out if the, what their issues are and if I can help. So that's available. All of that's at the digestivehealthinstitute.org. And they can join our Fast Track Diet official Facebook page. There's about 11,000 people on there chatting it up. Um, but Anthony, you know what we should talk about one of these days is the new probiotic for um, performance. I want to because that sounds interesting. Yelanella atypica. It's just a, a really interesting story. Some Harvard researchers. It has to do with looking at stool samples of Boston marathoners at the beginning and end of the race and what changed. Fascinating stuff. What, what, was, that, what was that called? Uh, it's uh, Villanella. B-E-I-L-L-O-N-E-L-L-A, -L 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 -E Villanella atypica, like atypical. Norm, I'm and, having you back on one of these days and we're talking it's a, about this. It's a, <laughs> you know what else we could talk about? Uh, Exercise-induced gastrointestinal syndrome. Uh, so you've got functional GI issues, but this syndrome is in people that are extreme athletes. Uh, more than two hours at... VO max, 60% uh, VO max. You probably know what that means better than I do. You know, kind of maximum exertion for two hours, like marathon runners. And what happens and why, why do some of these marathon runners have those issues at the finish line and so forth? There's, a, there's an explanation for that. So it's another area that's really kind of interesting. I love it. And I want you to, because that's going to be for another episode, Norm, but I want you to wrap this one up. Give us that last bit of inspiration or advice, that take home message from everything we talked about today for all of our listeners. Okay, great, yes. So um, people, <laughs> for GI issues, if you have gas, diarrhea, constipation, bloating, distension, all of these situations, right? Two rules of thumb that will really help you. Less is more, right? Eat less, leave meal spaces, leave spaces between your meals. Um, try some intermittent fasting if you have the weight to support that. And then secondly, just like your grandma said, eat really slowly and chew really well. That will help you digest the food that you're consuming better. More for you, less for the microbes. We want to put the microbes on a diet. That's what it's all about. I love that. <laughs> We're putting the microbes on a diet. That yeah. is awesome and probably not going to be the title of this episode. <laughs> Where can people get a hold of you if they want to find out more? I know you mentioned you had some books. I'll put the links in the show notes. But where yeah. can people find you, Norm? Two places, digestivehealthinstitute.org, blogs, a consultation program, the books, the mobile app. You can get links to those. But you can also find the apps on on um, uh, uh, Apple or Google um, in the Play Store. 
Uh, and then fa on Facebook, the Fast Track Diet official Facebook group. So you, you join, but we have three or four, five admins. So they'll let you in, I'm sure. I love that. And thank you guys for joining us on this week's episode of Health and Fitness Redefined. Don't forget, hit that subscribe button and join us next week as we dive deeper into this ever-changing field. And remember, fitness is a journey, not a destination. Put your microbes on a diet. Until next time. Yeah. <laughs>